NATO's are. Well, of course, you've got to remember that if you look at something like the Javelin, a friend of mine at Raytheon told me that, and this was ultimately posted by Fox News in one of the articles, but a friend at Raytheon said, look, we've gone through almost seven years of production of uh, Javelins in Ukraine. You know, it takes time to build these missiles, whether it's HIMARS or or Raytheon, Raytheon's other products like uh, NASAMs and so forth. All of these missiles are very complex, high-tech weapons. We, we've gone through our stockpiles very quickly, and we have no surge capacity, none. And that's something people don't understand. But the Russians have managed to very rapidly surge production. And the Europeans are very concerned about it. That's why inside NATO, behind closed doors, we were saying, we, this can't go on. You've got to end this, Washington. Everyone's at risk. We have nothing left. In fact, the whole tank issue is blowing up in everybody's faces because the tanks are simply not showing up. Suddenly, other European members are, are reluctant to commit their Leopard tanks. And if I were sitting in their shoes right now, I would feel the same way. Why would I send my armor over there. I might, in their minds, they say, well, once Ukraine is destroyed, we have to be able to defend ourselves. And I, I think they're right. To, to this argument, late last week, Jennifer, uh, excuse me, General Christopher Cavoli, I don't know if you know him, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, an American general, uh, was quoted as saying, Ukraine's losses are, quote, out of proportion to NATO's expectations. Now, that's consistent with what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I'm surprised to hear that from General Cavoli, unless this is the type of leak that's intended to acclimate the public to reality. Uh, that could be. Uh, Cavoli is the Supreme Commander, Europe, and what he says is certainly going to, going to have a huge impact in Europe. Most people in the United States won't pay any attention. But everybody in Europe will. And so in that sense, you could be right that he's signaling that this is not going to go on. We cannot sustain this. He's would, not going to come out and say it, but I think that's his message. Would someone of General Cavoli's position, an American four star, but commanding American and foreign troops to the extent that he's commanding them. Uh, you can tell me what that means uh, in Europe have needed the permission of the State Department or the Defense Department or the West Wing to make a statement that profound? Absolutely. Uh, he, it would have to have been vetted in the White House as well as with the Office of Secretary of Defense and I suspect the Secretary of State. He also used a phrase, and, and, and maybe this is uh, Military Science 101, I don't know. Precision can beat mass. Can you tell us what that means? Well, I, I did not necessarily use that. No, no, phrase. you didn't use it. General Cavoli did. Yeah, yeah. Cavoli is is not wrong. Uh, what you need, though, is is the following: wars are won and have been won, certainly for the last century plus, by accurate, devastating firepower. Your ability to direct accurate, devastating firepower against the enemy at a place and time and space that makes his position hopeless. Let's put it that way. We have precision, unfortunately for us, so do the Russians, so do the Chinese. This monopoly that we had for years on precision munitions is gone. Now what the Russians are demonstrating is that they understand that you need both. You want precision munitions, precision missiles, precision rockets, but you want huge quantities of them if you're going to win. So Cavoli is, is trying to sort of be on both sides of the equation. He said, well, precision can beat mass, yes, under certain circumstances. But if your opponent has precision and mass, probably not. And that's the case with Russia right now. Wow. Um, you and I also talked uh, about some of the behavior of Ukrainian agents and recruiting officials. I don't know if they're military or not. Uh, lowering the conscription age to 16. Now, everywhere in the world, a 16-year-old boy is a boy, not a man, not a fully developed man, and too young for the military, but I guess not too young for Ukraine. You and I shared uh, a video. I don't know how old this kid was, 14 or 15, was literally kidnapped right in front of his mother's eyes and shoved into a military truck. They were just walking 
down the street. What is this going to do for the morale uh, of the people in Ukraine? Is it common or is it isolated? And has, has the conscription age in Ukraine, this is almost child abuse, been lowered to 16? My impression is, yes, it has. And there are multiple sources confirming that this is the case. And there, there's lots of evidence being posted by Ukrainians all the time about the true situation. Uh, there are pictures of Ukrainian soldiers that are obviously, you know, 15, 16 years of age. So there's no doubt that this is going on. But I think this is, this is part of the larger picture. The Russians went into this economy of force and they maximized the effectiveness of their connectivity between space-based and terrestrial-based ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, assets above, and gun systems, rocket systems, missile systems. They've inflicted terrible casualties. Whole year groups of Ukrainian men are dead and are gone, have been annihilated. And at the same time, you have this much smaller population from which to draw on, as I talked about previously. There aren't 37 million people in Ukraine anymore. The, the areas that Zelensky controls, there are perhaps 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 million, which is roughly the size of the population of the Netherlands. That population is mostly male, I'm told, because lots of old men, women, and children have left the country. But still, the, the men that are there are not all able. Some of them are in advanced age, and lots of them are children. And so they're in desperation turning to this. Th this regime is at the end. It really is. But it's not going to give up. It's going to fight to the bitter end, and it's going to sacrifice whatever it can to stay in power. But when will Joe Biden and uh, Tony Blinken and Lloyd Austin and Jake Sullivan, the people that presumably are making these decisions, recognize what you just said, that the regime is at the end? I, I think that for all intents and purposes, that that message was delivered weeks ago from the Department of Defense to the White House, and it was rejected, yeah. period. Well, they're rejecting uh, reality in deference to their political needs. Well, guess well, we'll hear that in the State of the Union tonight. Well, I'm, I'm sure you'll hear an, an entirely erroneous picture. I mean, someone asked me today, how did we end up like this? I said, well, we've had 40 years of Cold War, at the end of which... The Soviet Union fell apart and we emerged, if not victorious, then certainly healthy and well. And we avoided global war, which was our goal for 40 years. In just one year, uh, we faced defeat in Ukraine through this proxy war. But more important, we're on the threshold of a potential confrontation with Russia, something that we worked for decades to avoid. So I guess the answer to your question, Judge, is it doesn't look good. Uh, mm. We're not going to admit failure. No one will say they were wrong. The uh, Russians love anniversaries. February 24th, of course, is the anniversary of the beginning of this military uh, incursion. Does Putin, from, from your sources, Colonel, does President Putin have his hundreds of thousands of reinforcements ready to pour in to eastern Ukraine and begin marching and killing and destroying on their way west. Yes, they, they're ready. That's why I thought that by now they would have already pulled the string, so to say, and have moved north. But the shaping attacks that have been going on down in southern Ukraine have essentially set the Russians up for multiple axes of advance from the south, up towards Russia up through the Bakhmut area and further east up along the, the border with Russia. Uh, I don't know how which one they're going to take. Maybe they'll take them all, but that has worked. Uh, why, why they have not already attacked, who knows? I mean, one thing I'm sure Sorovikin realizes and Gerasimov realizes is that their strategy of enticing the Ukrainians to attack them relentlessly has worked. Ukraine has been bled white. And they may be saying, well, there's no reason to rush. We can wait another three or four days. Let's wait for additional ammunition. Let's wait for additional whatever it might be. Remember, logistics is important. And they want to push forward ammunition, medical support, uh, more firepower, 
all of those kinds of things. And it may be they want to press, push some more forward, but the truth is they could go right now, and there's not much to stop them from going straight north and on the eastern side all the way to Kiev. Have you uh, seen any evidence of demoralization amongst the Ukrainian troops because of their vast uh, casualties? Anecdotally, uh, you go on Telegram and you look at the things that are being posted in Ukrainian by Ukrainians, and yes, there's plenty of evidence for it. There's no question about that. Also, the hatred and hostility is growing for Zelensky as more and more Ukrainians are blaming this, the Just divide. let me stop you. Is this hatred from the public, Ukrainian public, from the military, or both? Well, I'm talking primarily about soldiers in the field, but that may also apply to the population. We, I just don't have access to that in Western Ukraine. I don't know what they think there. But soldier-wise, oh, absolutely. And they're also looking at very corrupt leadership. You know, there, there are comments coming in all the time. You're stuffing your pockets with cash. You and the generals, you're corrupt leaders. And we're dying, you know, by the bushel every other day. I mean, assignment to Bakhmut for the last couple of months has been essentially a death warrant. And everybody knows it. Um, not too long ago, maybe two, three or four days ago, the former foreign minister of Poland revealed that at one point the Polish government was thinking of, I don't know how they would do this, physically, militarily, and legally, partitioning Ukraine and considering the western part of Ukraine, the, the part largely untouched by the war that includes uh, the capital, Kiev, as a Polish protectorate, and thereby triggering Article 5, the obligation of all of NATO to defend Poland, if that part of Ukraine, a la Polish protectorate, were attacked by Russia. I mean, this just sounds to me crazy. It almost sounds like the justification Hitler used to, to combine Austria to Germany to protect Austria, <laughs> even though the only people Austria needed to be protected from was him. Although most Austrians disagreed and they were quite happy to join the German state. I think Hitler is a bad comparison. Okay. Uh, I think I think a better comparison would be somebody like Stalin, you know, the, the man that murdered 16 times the number of people Hitler ever encountered. Uh, I think Poland is another state in the region with unfinished business. You've got to go all the way back to the First World War and understand the Second World War was an extension of the first. And then all of the people in the region that were formerly part of Austria-Hungary, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, even the German Imperial State or Prussia, all these places fell under Russian domination, Russian communist domination. And everyone was unhappy with it. Everyone hates it. And everyone felt betrayed. The Poles in particular, uh, once they got out from under Soviet occupation and control, always envisioned a time when they would regain their former stature in Europe as a great power. So these kinds of, of thoughts and, and strategies have been around forever. The problem is, if they, if they are seriously considering this, and they may be, I mean, it's hard for us to know, but I, not, nothing would surprise me. The, the Poles are romantics to the bitter end. If they think that by moving into Ukraine and claiming that they are acting in the name of NATO and Washington, that'll be the end of NATO. The Europeans will say, you've had it, you're on your own. We're not bankrolling your war to regain your empire against Russia. Well, we already know that the president of Poland has said his goal would be to claim back Crimea. Now, that is an impossibility, <laughs> and it's, in, it's insanity. Yeah, but you mean the Ukrainian president, right? No, the Polish president. Oh, said, he wants to recapture Crimea? <laughs> yes. He, he wants American troops and his troops and Ukrainian troops to recapture Crimea. This is an impossibility, and, and I think you'd argue you'd agree with me it's insanity for him to say that well he's obviously on hallucinogenics of some kind that would make him billions of dollars as he could mass produce it but no i i don't see any evidence for that happening and again look at everybody else involved and i i guess you have to accept make exceptions for people that live in northern norway that think that might be great who are on the edge of of the west and are totally remote from reality 
You may have some of those in England. I don't know. But everybody else on the continent of Europe will walk away from that. It, it, there's no chance of that. And that's the end of NATO. People just say, wait a minute. No, we're, we're not joining this war on Russia. Russia is not the Soviet Union. Is, is there any chance, no matter what Washington does, that Ukraine can win this war? Well, of course. Or that Putin can lose it? No, of course not. No, no, no. Putin isn't going to lose anything. And so, you know, somebody said, well, Putin is weakened and adrift. I said, you mean Joe Biden? They said, no, Putin. I said, no, Joe Biden, not Vladimir Putin. The Russians have a strategy. They know what they're doing. They're methodical. They're deliberate. They're effective. We don't. We, we never thought through the consequences of our actions. We're all sitting around here in Washington saying, oh, what do we do now? Ukrainians are going to lose. We can't have that. We've got to ship more over to them. What do we do? See, this has been my concern from day one, that then uh, people who are rank amateurs are saying, well, we've got to do something. Maybe we can move into Western Ukraine just out to Lvov and set up a safe zone. Uh, I don't think it's going to go down very well with the Russians at this point. You can't tell your opponent, you, you must be humiliated. Your state must be dismembered and your government must be destroyed. Then we will, we will kindly accept your surrender and welcome you into the brotherhood of international globalism or something. But that's effectively what we've been saying. So if you're a Russian right now, you're looking at this and saying, we're just going to keep going until there's nobody left in Ukraine that opposes us. And I, I'm afraid that's the path they're on. And I don't see any evidence that we're going to try to seriously arrest it. What will it take in your mind for uh, Zelensky to call up uh, Tony Blinken and say, let's start some back channel communications uh, with the Russian foreign minister because this can't go on much longer? Or, or is he not the type of rational person to do that? Or is Blinken not the type of person to accept that? Uh, I think Blinken and the president would have to assure Zelensky that he and his inner circle will be flown immediately to Miami or, or Malibu or somewhere and ensconced in wealthy homes and surroundings and live comfortably for the rest of their lives, in which case he might do that. But otherwise, forget it. All right. I want to uh, switch gears just a little bit. Colonel, where on the planet is the largest gathering of Chinese intelligence agents outside of China? Well, the largest uh, concentration, uh, let us say, of intelligence operation, in other words, the biggest operation outside of China, Yes, with all of the technology and capability, is probably in Mexico. Mexico. Probably, probably in, on the outskirts of Mexico City. And we obviously know at, at whom and at what those uh, intelligence activities are aimed if they're in Mexico. Yes, remember, the Soviet Union maintained its largest KGB operation in the world in Mexico because Mexico was very friendly to the Soviets. I mean, these are, these are old issues. Venezuela, Cuba, and Mexico were always pro-communist. They supported the communists in the Spanish Civil War. They supported the Soviets and the communists during the Second World War. They supported them ever since, off and on. So the bottom line is, uh, this, this is why this business about the balloon is so depressing. You know, the balloon is not large enough to carry a serious payload uh, that can communicate anything or collect anything. It's Somebody said, well, it's the size of three school buses. It has to be the size of the Goodyear blimp before you're going to put anything on it that makes any difference. And in the meantime, the Chinese, <clears throat> I think it's very clear that our ammunition stocks, as well as... Uh, Key items of equipment, uh, such as your self-propelled 155 millimeter gun, are in very short supply now as a result of having to supply the Ukrainians. You ask, is it dangerously low? It's only dangerous if we are contemplating a confrontation with the Russians. Uh, you know, that that is out of the question, in my view. And for that matter, if we were to go back to the Middle East and take on any number of opponents there, it would be equally ill-advised. So I would say it's not dangerous unless we are stupid and decide to intervene somewhere. Have we um, supplied the uh, Ukrainian military from our surplus or from our substance? Both. But we have had to rely increasingly on the substantive American military capabilities. There's now talk about sending even more sophisticated missiles 
with greater ranges, uh, which I find disturbing because the more we do this, the more likely we are to end up in a confrontation with the Russians for which we're completely unprepared. But there's talk about that right now in the media. The last time uh, we spoke, which was a day or two before Thanksgiving, uh, we talked about uh, whether or not there was any impetus on the part of the State Department or NATO uh, diplomats to push uh, President Zelensky and President Putin, to the extent they can push Putin anywhere, toward the negotiating table. In the interim, you sent me some videos which are too horrific for us to show, which show uh, Ukraine atrocities against captured Russian soldiers. So these are captured Russian soldiers who ought to have been protected by the Geneva Conventions. Obviously, they weren't. They were executed uh, with bullets in the head. Why would this have happened? Why would there have been videos of it? Why would the videos of it have been displayed uh, on uh, Ukraine streaming sites. Well, Judge, you're right. <clears throat> the video uh, videos that show Russian prisoners of war being essentially murdered after they've surrendered have been posted by Ukrainian soldiers. These are videos taken by Ukrainian soldiers and then posted on the internet, uh, essentially as a point of pride. Uh, in the belief that they are somehow another frightening or horrifying the Russians, who knows. But I also think there's another sinister dimension to this. I think there's an interest in Ukraine, particularly in Kiev or Kiev, to ensure that there can be no negotiated settlement between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Not, not so much because of uh, people in Kiev that might be willing to talk, but I think there's growing fear that Washington will ultimately abandon them. They know that uh, Ukraine fatigue is not exclusive to Europe. Ukraine fatigue is certainly having an impact inside the United States. They can read the news. They know that the new Republican Congress may well turn out to be much less willing to support them than the previous one. So under the circumstances, I think they want to make it almost impossible. And one way you do that is by murdering your opponent's soldiers and then posting videos about it because it so poisons the waters, if you will, with Russia. And it makes it so difficult for the Russians, particularly President Putin, to come to any arrangement because the Russian people are seeing these things and are incensed. You have Russian military commanders. And, and frankly, you know, from the beginning, we've accused the Russians of terrible things. They did not do those things. They did not mass rape. They did not mass murder. That's all nonsense. It's all propaganda that the Ukrainians cooked up and then was was disseminated across the West and eagerly regurgitated by the Western media, but it was never well, true. Well, I'm assuming that what you sent me was real. It certainly oh, looked it real. It's un absolutely, absolutely real. There was another video in the mix, though, that was kind of entertaining because it showed what appeared to be an attempt by the Ukrainians to orchestrate uh, a, a fake Russian attack on civilians. I mean, it, it, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess for us, uh, they showed the director of the operation, lights, cameras, and, and supporting people. It was you know, and this has been done before by the Ukrainians as well. All right. W would, would the um, mass display of Ukraine war crimes and atrocities on captured defenseless Russian soldiers boys, uh, have been approved by the high command, or is this some rogue uh, endeavor by the more hardcore of the Ukraine troops? Do you have an answer to that or an idea if there, on that? If, there, if this was a, a one-off uh, and then suddenly the Ukrainian government uh, directed that these videos be removed and then uh, made a statement that uh, they're going to look into this to establish the facts, and if this is in fact true, they will take action. If that had happened, then one would conclude that these were rogue elements, but that has not happened. And so the, the only conclusion I can reach is that people in Kiev are saying, look, uh, this will keep the war going. This will make it harder for the United States to abandon us because the Russians won't do business. And that's what they currently think is in their interest. 
Um, I want to put uh, on the screen a map of Ukraine, which you have seen. In fact, you were gracious enough to uh, send it to us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let our viewers take a moment or so to look at it. The, the red starbursts represent areas where there's been the concentration of Russian, military, of Russian missiles and uh, artillery. Uh, the blue represent areas of blackouts where there's no uh, electricity or water uh, to speak of. In the sort of lower right of this portion of Ukraine, the striped area represents the area that has been under Russians con Russia's control for a while. So let me start going all the way uh, west. Uh, are you surprised that uh, uh, the Russians sent their missiles all the way west? Well, what is the next country over there, West? Forgive, forgive my ignorance. Well, west uh, from the, the map that you're looking at right now where you see Lvov, just yeah. west of that 20 miles is the Polish border. Wow. Is it reckless for them to, for the Russians to send their missiles so close to the uh, Polish border? Is that a lesson to NATO? No, no, I, I, that's, it's not reckless at all. First of all, to understand what's happening now, this is very similar to what the United States did in Iraq, uh, to what it did to the Serbs during the, the Balkan campaigns, the Kosovo air campaign, very similar to what we did during World War II to Germany and Japan. We systematically identified the networks, the infrastructure for fuel, fuel storage, fuel distribution, and today power plants on a grand scale. We did that, we destroyed those places and essentially put countries in the dark and did exactly what you're describing, made it impossible for them to effectively lead normal lives. That was part of the plan. It worked very effectively in Germany. I mean, we, we were so effective against the fuel Re refining storage and distribution that it brought the Air Force and the, the Army almost to a standstill in Germany in 1945, certainly by the end of 44. Uh, so that's what that's what we're doing now. And this is long overdue. And this is part of the larger plan to prepare Ukraine for the coming offensives. I mean, why would you why would you let your opponent lead a comfortable, leisurely existence if you plan to attack him on a grand scale on the ground? Right. And see, before, when this first phase, no one ever completely grasped what Moscow wanted. They wanted a, an arrangement. They wanted a negotiated settlement. They were not interested in destroying the country. They didn't want to kill large numbers of people. By the middle of the summer, it was clear that's not going to work. So they threw those assumptions out. They went on to uh, essentially a strategic defense, an economy of force mission. Let's use as few forces as possible to hold on to what's ours, and then we'll build up for the offensive. And that's what's been going on. Now it's getting cold finally. So perhaps in three, four, five weeks or something, we'll see a major offensive. Gary, can you put the map up again? Colonel, I want to ask you about the sort of lower right-hand portion, if you will, right. where you see the gray and black stripes. Now, as I understand uh, uh, the uh, symbols on the map, that reflects the portions of Ukraine, which are uh, in, in which Russian speaking people live and which the yes. Russian government controls. Yes. If I'm correct, don't I also see some red uh, symbols there showing Putin attacking that area with either missiles or, or artillery? How unusual is that? There are Russians living there. Well, let's not let's not say Putin attacking. You know, he's in Moscow. And okay. these strikes are ordered by the co high command of the Russian theater and General Sorovikin. Okay, Strike so the, the, the generals in chief are attacking yeah. where Russians live. Am I right? Well, first of all, understand something. T today we have this, this capability we call strike. Strike is different from what we imagine the standard use for artillery or rockets or missiles might be in the West. The only thing that separates one strike from another is time and space. And we have precision, which means that we could literally, if we saw something in your backyard where you live, Judge, and we thought it was threatening to us, we could target it and destroy everything in your backyard without necessarily harming you. Now, we demonstrated that capability during the Kosovo air campaign. Some of your viewers will remember that the Albanians in particular were shocked at our ability to attack Serb forces 
that stood next to or were positioned very close to Albanian homes, but they never damaged any Albanian homes. Well, the Russians can do the same thing. And so there was a decision to attack there, ostensibly because there was some connectivity to this power generation network, and they All decided right. to remove it. Now, beyond that, I don't know the details, but it's eminently capable. they're eminently capable of doing this with great precision. That's why striking those uh, targets that were near the border with Poland was not reckless, because they know they can hit them with absolute precision. Okay, Gary, put the map up again, uh, please. So, Colonel, if the Russians can move with that much precision, then their uh, strikes around Lviv and Kiev, which we know destroyed residential areas, were done intentionally, that the destruction of homes and apartment buildings was not a byproduct. It was the goal. Is that fair no, to say? No, again, that's, that's, not, that's not accurate because the power stations and the power distribution networks were inside those areas. In right. other words, Where they, is they the decide we just want to level Keith. I mean, if they wanted to level Keith, they could do it tomorrow morning. It would take a couple of hours. So Where not on the map uh, is the uh, nuclear power plant or nuclear power plants? Well, the, the nuclear power plant of greatest interest, of course, is the one to the south uh, in the vicinity of Zaporozhye, which the Russians are protecting. The Ukrainians have repeatedly tried to launch missiles and rockets and artillery rounds against that power station in the hopes of precipitating a nuclear crisis that they think they would benefit from. All right. The right Russians above Zaporozhye, it shows the symbol for an explosion. Then yes. to the left of Zaporozhye is the blue symbol for a blackout. And to the right of Zaporozhye is the blue symbol for the blackout. So you're telling us that they want to isolate without destroying and prevent the use of the nuclear power plant in Zaporozhye. Yeah, well, they, it's not a question so much of preventing Ukrainians from using it. They, they are protecting that plant from Ukrainian attacks. Now, what they have done is that they have removed the connectivity, as you point out, uh, involving the transmission of power from these plants to Ukraine. That has been done, and that will continue to be done. And, and we ought to pause for a minute and understand the cascading effects of these attacks. This right. affects everything, every part of life in Ukraine. You're not just talking about transportation and, and water, of course. You're also talking about rural life where you have herds of cattle, herds of sheep, vast farmlands. Now those, thing, those, those animals and the farmland is lying fallow. The animals are dying. They're losing 20, 30% of their livestock, not because the Russians are killing them, but because they can't feed them. They can't move them. They can't sell them. They can't care for them. So the cascading effects are destroying completely the Ukrainian economy. So Ukraine's right. output is about non-existent now. So uh, December 1st is three days from now. There's already snow on the ground in uh, the northern parts uh, of Ukraine. Where do you see this going in the next four or five, six weeks, say, between now and the first of the year? Well, the, Ukraine, the experts on these matters, and I'm not one of them that knows something about the weather and uh, about the terrain in Ukraine. I've seen some of Ukraine, but not all of it. And... The Ukrainian black earth topsoil varies from 4 to 12 to 15 feet deep. It depends on where you are. That's why it's such a productive region. You have to freeze that because if it's not thoroughly frozen, you sink like a rock, whether you're in a truck or you're in a tank. It doesn't make any difference. It's not frozen yet. It's only just now dropped below freezing on a permanent basis. Up, up till this point, we've had freezing at night, but during the daytime, it's gone back up into the 40s or even 50 degrees. It has to drop below freezing and stay that way for at least two weeks. So if it's now below freezing and it stays that way, you can do the math. You're looking for something happening no earlier than the 10th, probably no later than the 19th of December. And you're talking okay, about concentrations of Russian troops all the way around the country. We've accounted now formally by look, these are the people that sit in front of your, in front of your monitors that, that control satellites. And uh, the intelligence community says that it's accounted for 540,000 Russian troops. 
right? Mm. And of that 540,000, we're talking about 5,000 armored fighting vehicles, of which at least 1,500 are tanks, probably another 1,000 uh, self-propelled artillery, the rest uh, infantry fighting vehicles, 1,000 rockets, missiles, tactical ballistic missiles, your, your so-called drones, unmanned attack systems, 1,000 of those systems. That doesn't even begin to address the hundreds of fixed-wing aircraft, hundreds of helicopters. The helicopters will move troops, obviously. There will be some ground support. Hundreds of, of fixed-wing aircraft operating as close air support and also bombers now. We've begun to see the use of bombers, which is something we've done for years. They're now beginning to do it, and they all have precision munitions. Okay, which, so what you aim at. What you've just described must be understood and known by President Zelensky, by Ukrainian intelligence, by American intelligence, by the State Department, by the Pentagon, and by the White House. Yes. And what are they going to do about it? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to ship more equipment to the Ukrainians. The problem is the Ukrainian casualties have been horrendous, particularly over the last few months. There was an article today in the in the Euro News, uh, I'm told there's another one in the New York Times describing the very, very heavy casualties. Of course, the big lie that is always told to accompany the bad news is, well, the Russians have taken heavy casualties too. Nonsense. The Russians have not. And uh, that's the difference. When you're, you're killing your enemy at a 10 to 1 ratio, which is about where it is right now in southern Ukraine with the Russians and Ukrainians, you're not hurting at all. And the Russians, again, aren't running out of anything. The Ukrainians are running out of everything ammunition, spare parts, fuel, you name it. Their soldiers, most of the best troops are dead or wounded. And the people that they're shoving forward in, in the defensive positions are untrained reservists. They say, well, we sent 10,000 more troops to England for three weeks. Judge, you're not going to be able to train a man in three weeks to do much of anything or even five weeks. You need time. And time is something the Ukrainians no longer have. So the, right, whole, you are back. the whole thing is the whole thing is on the verge of collapse. Let's pretend you are back in the Pentagon as you were for a portion of the Trump administration. <clears throat> and uh, Secretary Austin, along with Secretary Blinken, knock on your door. <clears throat> Colonel, what, what's your advice? What would you tell them? Get the oh, hell I out? Would, I would show them the map and show them the identified concentrations of Russian forces along with a list of the capabilities, which are impressive in terms of firepower and maneuver. And I would also then bring up a, a, a truthful picture of Ukrainian fighting capabilities right now, which are very, very modest. And I would argue, given the terrible conditions that the population faces in Ukraine, it's no surprise that the Ukrainian government is saying leave. Even Klitschko, who is the mayor of Kiev, has told the population, you really should leave. We're not going to have any power. We won't have water and fuel to heat. Uh, you're going to have to go somewhere else and seek shelter. This is the capital city. And millions of these Ukrainians are going to pack it in and they're going to head west. So you're going to have another gigantic mass casualty event, if you will, on Europe's doorstep with millions of refugees pouring into Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. And obviously, in many, in many cases, these frontline states will simply herd them further West into other countries and because they can't take anymore. Back the to my hypothetical, plan. back to my, my hypothetical door knocking. What can the American government say to President Zelensky to get him to the negotiating table? You're not getting anything else from us? Uh, first of all, Zelensky will do what you tell him. So if you tell Zelensky that the game is up, it's time to come to terms with reality. This is, this is an injustice, a monstrous injustice to the Ukrainian people to fight on at this point. We'll have to accept the fact that a negotiation is necessary. We're going to have to accept that concessions will be made, including territorial concessions. And if you do that, the Ukrainians will go along with it. They won't like it, but they'll go along with it. Now, there is a theory that Zelensky, if he goes along with something like this, will be killed by the radical nationalists. Well, I suppose that's possible. I can't prove that. I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is that 
you should draw the, the obvious conclusions. You know, your position is untenable. It's effectively hopeless. And, you, you know, you need to end this thing before matters get much, much worse. But there's no willing to do, willingness to do that because the, the pain, even though we're suffering <clears throat> economically from some of the after effects of our sanctions that have done more damage to us and our lives, well, my impression is, based upon the reports I've received from friends on the inside, is that we turned the transponders off that are normally attached to the unmanned uh, vehicle. As a result, uh, we were trying to move in close within the air defense identification zone that belongs to the Russians. Everybody has these. When you move into that ADIZ, you're supposed to acknowledge that you're there, identify yourself. Obviously, we didn't want to do that. So without the transponders, uh, it was trying to be stealthy and uh, gather intelligence on the Crimean installations, installations on Crimea that belonged to the Russian military. It didn't work out. And the Russians uh, were within their international, within the legal bounds of international law to take it out, which they did. Whether or not they actually did it in the way that's described, I don't know. That sounded suspicious. I haven't heard of planes colliding with other planes to take them down. Have you heard of uh, planes emptying their fuel on drones, almost as if to uh, mimic a dog urinating? No, I, I haven't, uh, haven't heard that either. I mean, quite frankly, I don't know how it happened, but I do know that the Russians disposed of it and it crashed into the sea. And I know why it was there. It was there to collect intelligence, targeting data, for installations in Crimea. Oh, they my. Also, they also this, use it, I'm told, to target the bridge that uh, we tried to destroy. Is this any different from a, a Chinese balloon? Well, it is different in the sense that this is inside the air defense identification zone of Russia. And yes, you're right. The Chinese balloon was inside our air, de air defense identification zone. And we were within our legal rights to shoot it down. So absolutely, that's true. But I think uh, this is not the first time that this has happened. I think the Russians have simply sent a message. We're, we're, we're not going to tolerate it anymore. How um, effective, you know, I, I just estimated 10,000 feet. I mean, do you know how high it was and how effective these drones are uh, at uh, gathering data about uh, Russian military activities in Crimea? Well, I think they're very effective in terms of collecting data. Uh, whether they're more effective at 10,000 than they are at 5,000, or it makes no difference, I don't know. But I do know that all these unmanned collectors, whether it's Global Hawk or the, the one that we're talking about, are all excellent and do a, a great job. Um, I, I heard a statement from uh, President Putin uh, the other day. I mean, I heard it translated uh, into English. Uh, about uh, the relationship between the United States and Germany. I think you know where I'm going. President Putin said, Germany is still occupied. He didn't finish the sentence, but I think he obviously meant occupied as it was by the Allied forces after World War II, uh, an historic event with which we're all generally familiar. He was basically mocking uh, the German government for putting up with the American government, telling it to sit down, be quiet, be a good boy while we destroy your pipeline with Russia. Yes, I wouldn't quite term the uh, condition of our influence in Germany as equal to an occupation. That's that's over the top. But clearly, uh, Mr. Schultz has behaved as though he were a vassal of the greater American empire. Today, I received an email about a firm in Germany that uh, is involved with metal work. Uh, they, they, they make alloys, they build alloys, and they also bend metal and so forth. This firm has been in business since 1380. As a, result, as a result of the loss of cheap energy, in other words, energy they can afford, which was the natural gas that came out of Russia, this firm, for the first time since 1380, is going out of business. And uh, thousands of people are going to suffer as a result of this. And this is completely unnecessary. This shouldn't have happened. But that's just one more piece of evidence for the stupidity and the folly of destroying the Nord Stream 2. Uh, we, that was a monumental mistake. It's an act of war by the United States against the Germans. I don't think Mr. Schultz and his friends are going to be in government too much longer. 
I can't predict when, but I think the German people are, are going to object to this and they've had enough of it. Well, they're going to find that guy on the, on the sailboat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like the minnow, the boat that got lost on Gilligan's Island. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is absurd. Uh, well, actually, I think, I think I think we have to give Gilligan more credit. Uh, he'd have done a better job, uh, at least <laughs> of creating fiction. Now, this is this is utterly absurd, but this is the CIA. And, and you're making an important point. If you look at the recent articles that have come out in the New York Times and the Washington Post just within the last 48 hours, we're now beginning to see the truth actually creep into articles about the Ukraine war. And what I'm talking about are the horrific casualties that the Ukrainians are taking the devastating impact of, of Russian artillery and Russian rockets and missiles, the, the terrible conditions for, for life for the people in Ukraine. It's actually being mentioned now. So that's a good thing. You uh, recently wrote uh, that uh, well-regarded estimates show that between 150 and 200,000 Ukrainians have been killed in action. These are military people killed in action, and you saw another estimate that was as high as 250,000. Yes. How big is their army? How much longer could they tolerate a well, loss of 200,000 in, in 12 months? Well, this is, this is another important question, and I think Ukraine has actually built three armies. They had one that we destroyed, or actually the Russians destroyed, uh, early in the war, I would say between February and July, a second army was configured, equipped, and sent into action after July, and that one was largely destroyed by Christmas. And then a third one was constructed. This is all based on waves of mobilization, uh, inducting people forcibly and otherwise. It's gotten so bad with the manpower shortage in Ukraine that just yesterday I received reports from people in Odessa that told me they were watching as Ukrainian men of various ages from 16 up to 50 were being apprehended in cafes and restaurants in Odessa, mm. shoved into trucks and disappearing. Literally, no, no questions, no discussion. Get on the truck, gun in your face, you're going to the front. And we know from the reports we're getting from Ukrainian soldiers that post these things on the internet that the average life on the front for a new recruit is about, what, three or four hours because well, these people have no experience. They may get, if they're lucky, three or four weeks of training, some time on a rifle range. That's absurd. So they're getting more and more people killed needlessly. Colonel, even if they have three or four weeks of training, if they don't have ammunition in their weapons, the yeah. training is moot. They're just a body being sent out there to slaughter. Well, they, they are receiving... Uh, small arms ammunition, maybe not as much as they would like. And of course, if you're in a, in a combat zone, I can tell you from experience, you never have enough ammunition. You've right. got it piled up all around you. you did, the last thing in the world is you don't want to run out of it. The problem for the Ukrainians is they've run out of artillery ammunition. And so they're not giving artillery support to their soldiers. Now, you're talking about a war which the Russians already have a 10 to 1 advantage in firepower from artillery systems. Now their own artillery can't fire because they don't have any more 155 shells. When you look at the losses, they range in the thousands for howitzers, tanks, and other equipment. The Russians are killing these things as fast as they show up. And a lot of it is, is done in the following way. A, a small drone is flown over Ukrainian lines. They discover that there's a, an artillery system, an air defense system, a radar then come a different set of drones that literally fly right into those pieces of equipment and disable them. And then if that's not enough, rocket artillery rains down on what's there and kills everyone. So this is a sort of procedure that goes on again and again and again. Let's talk a big picture in, in a, a piece you recently uh, published with apologies to Winston Churchill entitled The Gathering Storm. Great title, Colonel. Uh, you actually give a little bit of praise to Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who, whom you refer to as a rabid supporter of the proxy war. We all know that. But one who recognizes that President Zelensky's insistence that we uh, assist them 
to recapture the Crimea is A, absurd, and B, is a red line, uh, which would result in disastrous uh, consequences from President Putin. Right. Well, it's too bad he didn't reach that conclusion many months ago when right. we could have said that in January or December right. of last year and avoided that pointless discussion. The other thing is, I think William Butler Yates was the first to talk about the gathering storm. So I don't think okay. it's been originated that. But having said all of that. <laughs> uh, you mean they they taught English courses at West Point? <laughs> uh, I, I think we had good English I love, I love Yates. I we did it. have some pretty good English instructors. I got to give them credit at West Point. Actually, the, the best one I had was at VMI, but that's a long story. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that people inside the administration, not just Secretary, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, are realizing this is an unwinnable war for the yes. Ukrainians. They know that. They, they know the true picture, the real losses. Remember that when Zelensky and his general Zeluzhny came over here, in private, they were very frank and open about the seriousness of the situation. They were afraid of an immediate Russian offensive. This is in January. That didn't happen, fortunately, because of the weather. That gave them a new lease of life through the spring. And so they hoped that they would get this massive influx of equipment. But we've reached the point now where even if they received laser pistols that everyone could use, they don't have people trained to use it. They don't have the trained manpower. The losses have been so bad, there's no combat experience. People like that just show up and die. And sure. that's exactly what's happening in eastern Ukraine. So when President Zelensky says publicly and privately, I assume privately, uh, we want you to help us liberate um, Ukraine, uh, liberate um, Crimea, is he, is he dumb like a fox? Is he really asking for more than he expects to get so that what he does get will be enough to achieve realistic goals? Or does he really and truly believe that the West would help him invade Crimea no matter what the cost? And we can all only imagine what that cost would be. Uh, I think that he's been told several times over the last several years as this war approached. Remember, this is not a surprise. Right. Uh, the, the Ukrainian military was built expressly for this purpose of fighting Russia. We thought that the Ukrainians would have the initiative and attack the two so-called breakaway republics first. That didn't happen. Putin preempted them and went into the area. But I think they have been told this over and over and over again. Now, we know that's not possible, but it may be he's also being told to maintain this fiction to the bitter end. If you say anything other than what we have been saying for months, we won't support you anymore. That's a distinct possibility. He did uh, recently ask for cluster bombs. Now, cluster bombs have been defined as a war crime. I don't know how he knows we have them. I didn't know we have them. I don't know what we're doing with them. I'd, I'd be extremely dismayed if we gave them to him. Why would he ask for something like that? Well, I don't think he's concerned about damage to civilians because the Ukrainian artillery in Donetsk has been firing artillery rounds into, into urban areas populated by Russians in Donetsk and Luhansk now for months and months and months. Remember, they killed 14,000 people between the coup and the invasion of right. Ukraine by the Russians. That's one of the reasons they went in. They wanted to put a stop to this. And it's now stopping, not completely, but they're getting closer to it on the Russian side. So I, I don't think he's worried about that. But we, under no circumstances, should supply it. I can tell you from personal experience with these munitions, they have a, a big problem with the dud rate. You, if you have 10, 15, 20 percent of the bomblets that do not explode, then they end up in the hands of children who don't know what they're looking at. It looks like a right. baseball. Right. And then you have horrific injuries. And then beyond that, then your, your wheeled vehicles, if they drive over them, they'll be destroyed. Right. It's a dumb idea. I would get rid of it. Well, we all signed, or certainly the U.S. signed a, a treaty in 2004. There are unmistakably, indisputably uh, elements of war crimes and, and prohibited, but who knows if we really have them. Um, a good friend of mine interviewed a good friend of yours. <laughs> John Stewart interviewed Dave Petraeus. So here's uh, General Petraeus. In fairness to him, at his ridiculous best, 
The security challenges that face us right now are more complex and actually greater than any that we have faced actually during the post-Cold War era. It's just hard to see the evidence of a learning curve manifest. It still feels like our foreign policy is everything, everywhere, all at once. Well, I, th I think the argument there is going to be that, look, if we don't do it, someone else will. If you think of us as the guy in the circus who puts a plate on the stick and gets it spinning, the biggest plate, I think bigger than all the others uh, together, is China. It's the U.S. relationship with China, the U.S. with our allies and partners. They help us keep some of these plates spinning. But then you have still North Korea with its nuclear program. Just but perhaps maybe the, the then issue there's is Russia, there's we're not going to solve. And maybe but it's, it's American okay. Just understanding. Just keep the plate spinning. So John Stewart is trying to make uh, the argument against the use of American military to advance American exceptionalism, an argument you have made, I have made, people that agree with us have made, people watching us now have made. What the hell is Petraeus talking about? Plates spinning. Do you know? Can you, can you guess? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, of the two comedians, I <laughs> thought that John Stewart was far more persuasive, obviously. And yes. Just you know, we can't afford to be everywhere doing everything all the time. He could have added one more po point that no one wants to admit in Washington. We don't need to be everywhere doing everything all the time. See, Petraeus lives in this fantasy world where the world is full of threats. Everyone is a potential enemy. And there are only certain people who are friends and everyone else is an enemy. Therefore, there are lots of enemies. So we have to be everywhere and we can't succeed. He knows that. We can't win, but that's all right. You just stay there in perpetuity. In other words, it's like Afghanistan. You could stay in Afghanistan for 50 more years and have no impact whatsoever on the place. That's okay. The point is to stay for 50 years. <laughs> so what, what, what military or what, what American benefit is there to follow the advice that General Petraeus had offered? Oh, none. 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 Why he says stuff like that, I guess he still wants to uh, be considered relevant with his uh, successors in the Defense Department uh, or, or the Central Intelligence Agency, but it obviously has no credibility, and you're right, even though they were talking over each other, unlike you and I, and, and I'm not critical of John, that's his style, and he is my friend, and I spent a lot of time with him on, on his show, The Daily Show, uh, uh, but, but for the general to say we're spinning tops or spinning plates like a guy in the circus, and that's really uh, our goal, uh, is absurd 